In the world of adventure riding, there is a lot of iconic bikes, but one for us that stands out the most in particular is right here in front of me. This is the history and depth of the Kawasaki KLR 650. So if you've been following us around for a while, then you know how much we love the Kawasaki KLR650. This bike's 30 year lifespan makes it one of the longest running production bikes that is made up until 2018 that is of course, rest in pieces KLR. But you could make the argument that this bike does prove that dinosaurs did exist. But today we wanna to just pay tribute to this iconic bike and give credit where credit is due. At the heart of the KLR650 is a 651cc counterbalanced big thumper that commonly burns oil and almost never surprises you. It actually has a backwards ratio of CO2s emitted to number of ponies that it's putting out. And that's actually one of the biggest reasons that it's no longer being made. But we learned hard and decently fast to love this bike. After all, we've been through it together, it will always have a special place in our hearts. Some people may tell you that the KLR is slow, dull, and plain and simple boring that the frame was unstable and easily severed from the subframe, and that the whole motorcycle probably belongs in a museum. But the funny thing is, is that many of those same people will tell you that the KLR 650 is also the ultimate jack of all trades and the best used bike in its category. You know, some common nicknames are the Swiss Army Knife of Adventure Bikes, Jack of All Trades, Master of None, Two Wheel Jeep, Pack Mule, Tractor, Killer, and our personal favorite, Curly. This bike has taken people to places we never thought possible, including circumnavigating the globe multiple times, and it will outlast just about anything, but not limited to any McDonald's sandwich, Twinkies, and a Nokia brick phone. So pre-KLR650 days, Kawasaki was producing two dual sport bikes, the KL600 and the KLR250. Kawasaki looked into their crystal ball and saw a bike that could run for 30 years with barely any changes, a bike whose sales could fund the R&D for more modern and sensible bikes. Now in 1987, the year that U2 still couldn't find what they were looking for, the KLR was brought to life, and at an MSRP of $2,999, it was a steal of a deal. And in the first year of production, an estimated 8,700 bikes were assembled and distributed. For us and many other riders, the KLR is what we like to consider the gateway drug to adventure riding. They're cheap, reliable, surprisingly capable, absolutely decent on the road, and for better or for worse, a rush to ride off-road as well. You could say this bike does have the most miles per dollar ratio of any bike that is on the market. Now from our own experience, to have the most fun on a KLR is when you and all your buddies, you're all on the same bike. That'll just kind of help level the playing field. But if you do find yourself on the KLR in the midst of other riders on more capable bikes, truth be told, you're gonna find the limits of the KLR pretty quick. Now over the years, not much has changed on the old KLR except for some limited stickers and the KLR and 650 logo bouncing around from place to place on the bike. Now Kawasaki also tested out a rainbow of plastic colors. The colors did get a little wild during the 90s, including a Malibu Barbie color combo, and the best that we can tell is a navy green that has an eight year run. That may be the most beautiful navy green KLR in the world. I mean, Kawasaki was on their game when they came up with that color. They really were. They really were. It's been a struggle trying to figure out what color it really is. Navy green, I think, is descriptive. But yeah, I love it. It is beautiful. You did a good job polishing that. I like to polish. In 89 or 90, they did change the counter shaft, so the sprocket is different on the 87 and 88 models. In 1996, there was actually several changes made to the bike. The cylinder head, the cylinder, balancer sprockets, counter shaft sprocket change from a clip to a nut, plus one clutch plate and a flywheel to name a few, but ultimately most of those changes were insignificant. 96 was also the last year of the black engine until they brought it back in 2011. In 2001, assembly of the KLR was moved from Japan to Thailand. 2006 was the first year that the North American bikes were available in more than one colorway for that year. Lucky us. It brings truth to the great saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it and Kawasaki stood by that motto for 20 years. 
2008 brought the only real notable change redesign of the KLR 650, which did make it more attractive to some and actually less attractive to others. But it came at a cost, which we'll explain later. The fork diameter was increased from 38 millimeters to 41 millimeters, but still remained undersprung with valving too soft for luggage and minor to aggressive off-road riding. That was until the new addition in 2014. Other notable changes for 2008 is it got a new D-shaped swing arm, dual headlights, dual piston calipers front and rear, and upgrades to the cooling system, spoke size increased from 3.5 to 4 millimeters, new stator taking it from 14.5 to 17 amps, and the 2008 also gained 17 pounds over the Gen 1. Now the 2008 and the early 2009 models were known to burn oil because of a piston ring problem, but honestly for us wasn't new news because pretty much every KLR we've ever had burns oil, especially at higher RPMs. In 2009, frames and racks go to black for the first time, thinner piston rings to supposedly fix oil burning issues. In 2012, black theme continues with black rims, black forks, and swing arm. The 2014 and a half new edition brought some much needed stiffer suspension. In fact, the springs were 40% stiffer with increased dampening, 63% stiffer shock spring with increased dampening, a stiffer seat, new decals, but as the age old bike rose, so did the emission standards for motorcycles. So in 2018, unfortunately, Kawasaki put an end to the production of the KLR, and we have yet to hear of any plans to fill the hold in the lineup. Now regardless of the year of the KLR or even the changes that were made, the fact still remains, this really is a bike for everyone. This bike has literally been used for all types of purposes and all types of terrains. It's loved by ADV riders, including everyone from weekend warriors, transcontinental riders, and even the round the world riders. This bike is still used by military today. It's unapologetic utilitarian and it fulfills a huge part of the dual sport and adventure market. So that begs the question, what makes the KLR so special? One of the first things that comes to mind about what sets the KLR apart <laughs> is the damn near flat torque curve. This thing might not get itself out of the mud, but you can bet on it getting your buddies out. It has a 6.1 gallon fuel tank stock, which actually holds about 5.8 gallons, but has an estimated 350 mile range when it's full. And for this reason, people call it the tanker. Another big thing that stands out is simplicity. It's a carbureted single cylinder engine that's easy to diagnose and easy to work on. It's ideal for adventure riders around the world. It's cheap. A brand new 2018 model has an MSRP of less than $7,000. So you're getting a capable and very reliable dual sport bike for a great price. Honestly, the only thing cheaper than the KLR itself is probably the owner. It has a 21 inch front wheel, which means there's plenty of aggressive tire options. It has a 17 inch rear wheel. We wish it had an 18, but there's still plenty of great aggressive tire options for a 17 inch wheel. Another great thing about the bike is it does come pretty, you could call it, set up from the factory. You've got hand guards, decent knobby tires, stock skid plate, and you have a rear top rack. The KLR is boringly reliable. The only drama that can come with these things is what we like to call the WAG. Or in other words, wide open throttle on the highway or the unpredictability when riding gnarly train off-road. Oh, and one more thing, do not forget to change the doohickey. Now there's a big debate out there of which KLR generation is better, the Gen 1 or Gen 2. And after long studies of grueling, rigorous scientific testing, we've got a few things to consider. When it comes to ground clearance, the 8707 first gen actually has one more inch than the 2008 plus second generation. On the Gen 1, you do have cheaper plastics versus the updated tank shrouds that you have on the Gen 2. Now with the Gen 2, you are gonna get those updated looks, but on the Gen 2, there is no such thing as a minor tip over because chances are if you tip this bike over, you're gonna damage the tank shrouds unless you have crash bars. Now when it comes to handling, what we have found is that during off-road sections, the first gen is generally happier with the rider sitting down. With the second gen, it's just happier with the rider on it. Now when it comes to price, obviously the first gen, it's gonna be the cheaper option because it's older, there's more of them out there, which means there's more to be loved. The curb weight for the Gen 2 is about 432 pounds, about 415 for the Gen 1, but most importantly, the Gen 1 is actually way easier to wheelie. It takes some real effort to get the Gen 2 wheel off the ground. So in conclusion, if you ride a lot more dirt, go with Gen 1. If you tip over a lot, go with Gen 1. If you really don't care about looks, go with either one. Now with all the praise that we've given the KLR, we definitely have our fair share of complaints that 
frankly, Kawasaki had 30 years to fix and chose not to. The first thing I want to talk about is that there's no fuel gauge on this bike. You have all that gas, but no fuel gauge. But luckily, there is a reserve on the petcock. Now, some riders don't like the new front fender on the Gen 2, but there is a Polysport as a replacement. Personally, for me, I don't think it's that bad. And thirdly, it's the top speed on the bike. Usually, it's about 70 miles per hour-ish, depending if you have a headwind or a tailwind. But for us, it's really not that big of a deal. We like to enjoy the ride, and we think the KLR does too. Now, if you are lucky to find yourself a KLR, the list of upgrades and improvements you can make to these bikes, it is a long list. That's a completely other video. That video, as a matter of fact, you can find in the description because we have a great bike build. We'll show you everything that we do to these to get them adventure ready. And that does it for our tribute to the KLR 650, a bike with a class of its own, sadly gone, but not forgotten. Now, remember, go to RockyBoundHVMC.com to get all your parts and accessories. I am Chase. Thanks for watching.